I must say the last time I was included in such a sumptuous feast of language and work and words was um, here in Cork uh, towards the end of last summer when many of us gathered in the Triscoll uh, Arts to uh, prepare to take Matthew Sweeney um, north uh, to his burial. And um, I came a day late and a dollar short and have felt ever since that there was a lot of unfinished business to tend to. I think that might be one of the um, tattoos of heartbreak that um, we feel like there's still work to do. Anyway, I was, uh, I went back, uh, after we finished in Ballyliff and I went back to um, a Moveen to figure out what it was that had happened. And like most writers, I carried it around an agenda of things that have to get done. And we're always looking for the um, elusive win-win situation where we can write something of meaning to ourselves that we can repurpose to fit some commission that we have or something like that. So um, at the time I was in a long-standing squabble with an editor in New York about the title for new and selected essays. Um, the sales department there in New York really wanted me to call it the hearse whisperer. <laughs> new and selected essays. And um, I had gone from being uh, convinced that that was not a good title to convinced that I couldn't sign the contract. And so one of the things I tried to do in making notes about funerals at large and funerals in particular, Matthews, was um, to write a title essay for the selected essays that I was hoping to publish this fall. And um, so in, in the um, Southward Journal, which uh, I was happy to place this in, the title of the essay is The Dumb Thing, comma, Corporal and Spiritual Works, comma, Bone Rosary, comma, Grievous Love, uh, which seems to go on a bit, but I, I then sent this essay and said, you can take any or all of that title and make it the title of my new and selected essays. What I have to say about things are in here, so, uh, uh, and of course, they didn't like that either, so <laughs> we ended up uh, uh, going with the deposition, uh, or depositions, I think, which is a term of art for getting the dead from one place to another. Uh, in particular, uh, getting the body of uh, the crucified Christ uh, into the uh, tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had prepared for him. It's usually Joseph and Nicodemus who are seen at the top of the cross with sheets lowering the corpse into its uh, oblivion. And I don't know if I want to uh, read from this now or if I'm, if I'm able to read from it now, but I do want you to know how very gifted I felt um, by Matthew's last visit to America in October of 2016. Um, I had conspired with a woman who had been a student in one of Matthew's workshops when he was earlier in America, in Michigan. And um, I said, if you get him over here and pay him a, a decent stipend, um, he can stay with me, you'll have no lodging costs. And I think I knew that he had uh, arranged with uh, David O'Meara, a friend of this festival, who uh, has a, a similar festival in uh, Ottawa, Canada, to have Matthew go up there and then back over. And so Matthew stayed with me for three weeks up at uh, uh, Mullet Lake in northern Michigan, just south of the bridge that connects the two peninsulas uh, of Michigan. And um, it gave us a, a chance to talk about a lot of things. A lot of the poems that uh, formed his last collection uh, were written there, and I, I just feel very um, lucky that I had that time with him. But I want to tell you about a time in the mid-90s um, when the BBC, apparently flush with EU money, 
um, would commission writers for a program called Something to Write Home About. Some of you are old enough to remember this. And they fell upon the notion of asking Matthew Sweeney, where do you want to go? And we'll send a producer and a recorder and, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll get a, a show out of it called uh, Something to Write Home About. Where do you want to go, Matthew? I want to go to the moon, he said. <laughs> and um, they said, well, we can't take you to the moon. I, is there an alternative uh, a destination? He said, I want to go to northern Michigan and uh, uh, see where you can eat bear meat and coyotes and things like that. He was mad, as some of you know, for wild game food. Uh, and he thought he could probably improve it with whatever he would do in the kitchen. So over they came, they called me, and they said, would you be able to organize some events where he could talk and we could record him and stuff like that? And I thought, I said, well, first I'll drive you around, and it would be a pleasure to do that. And then I thought, well, I'll call Jim Harrison. Some of you know Jim Harrison's fiction and poetry. Uh, some of you will have seen the movie Legends of the Fall, which is a, one of his novellas. I think he knocked it out in eight or nine days. Uh, and um, But... Uh, I, because Jim was also a foodie and um, a poet, I thought, that'll be a nice match. I'll arrange a meal, a feast, between these two poets, and they can talk about food or uh, whatever else they want to talk about. It was, um, And I, I knew a, a restaurateur in northern Michigan who had a, you know, kind of a linen tablecloth kind of place, and I called him, I said, well, I'm bringing two... Uh, uh, internationally known poets uh, uh, to your place to have a meal and the BBC is sponsoring this meal don't worry about a thing I want your best effort on the day and um, so he cleaned out the restaurant we were the only table being served the newspaper was there they were taking pictures they, and it, but when, when all the dust came out it was just the BBC lady Jim Harrison, Matthew Sweeney and myself and uh, Jim Harrison had just gotten quite wealthy with uh, Legends of the Fall, and he had $100 bills coming out of every pocket, with, <laughs> which he was tipping the wait staff. He was very generous. And I told him, you won't have to pay for anything, Jim, and, and we'll put you in a room right next door, which you won't have to pay for, but you can drink all you want. And I was the designated driver for all of these events. And uh, anyway, we had this uh, wonderful meal, eight or ten courses, and lots of talk and lots of recording. And uh, I, between the, the last course and the dessert course, I slipped to the loo and following me in was our host on the evening who seemed very agitated. He said, I don't know what to do. I've never, Tom, I don't know what to do because I've never had a bill like this. I've never had a fare like this for a meal. It seems that Harrison and Sweeney had gotten into a competition regarding the wine list and the wine cellar at the restaurant. <laughs> And they were kind of trying to one-up each other with, and they both had a capacity for drinking, it turns out. Um, and uh, they, so the meal had gone on for, I think, maybe three and a half or four hours. And uh, the bill kept going up and up and up. And I said well, to the restaurant, I said, well, is this your hobby? He said, no, it's our, our family's work. I said, well, then charge them retail, give the bill to the woman from the BBC. Everything will be just fine. And... Uh, the woman from the BBC got the bill, she gave them a card, it was paid for. When she got back in the car, Matthew and the BBC and me, to go back to the lake, she said, I'll be fired, of course, because I've never, I, I was never authorized to spend this kind of money. <laughs> she said, the conversation was better than anything uh, I could have imagined. It was well, and the food was delicious. It was well worth it. I'll be fired, but so what? It was great on all other accounts. It turns out she was never fired at all. Uh, she got an award, she got a prize for the conversations between Sweeney and Harrison, and um, I think I might have one of the only digital copies of it left. And, um, and uh, but what I want to end with is um, a poem by Jim Harrison, uh, which I read to Matthew when he was there in 2016. There's an autumnal feeling about October in Michigan. Leaves are changing, they're going bald, Things are slumping to the uh, winter that's just before us. We really don't know what to do about it. There is the sense that we are like everything else in nature, into our anecdotage and winding down. 
I was talking to Dr. Fallon this afternoon, and it turns out after a certain age, it seems like we're into that red zone where the people we love the most are the people we lose the most and the people we miss the most and what to make of this. So Jim Harrison died in 2016, some months before Matthew came over for his visit. He died at his table in uh, Arizona writing a poem. He fell to the floor with a pen in his hand. A good death for a poet. Um, and I think maybe he understood exactly what death was. Anyway, we went up to Jim's old writing cabin up in Grand Marais. He had given us the directions to it. It was a place that nobody visited. When you drive, start a mile long two track drive back to Sucker Creek where his writing cabin was, there was a sign announcing uh, visitors by appointment only. And about a third of the way in there was another sign that said, there are no appointments. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Matthew hoarding the, the nights to himself at Mullet Lake, keeping counsel with my old dog, who also died the year that Matthew died. I, uh, I, I just began to associate this, um, this situation with Jim and Matthew and the rest of it. So when we were up at his cabin, I read Matthew, this poet, and he, this poem, and he got very silent. And then we drove home. And he kept staying up nights, sipping wine, talking to the dog, and writing the poems, that, many of which became his last book. So I'll end with this. It's a poem called Barking by Jim Harrison. The moon comes up. The moon goes down. This is to inform you that I didn't die young. Age swept past me, but I caught up. Spring has begun here, and each day brings new birds up from Mexico. Yesterday, I got a call from the outside world, but I said no in thunder. I was a dog and a short chain. And now there's no chain. Okay. <laughs>